I'd like to preface my comments tonight by saying something I said last week, but maybe didn't make it clear. Uh, my experience is I'm not validating or, or uh, nailing and uh, laying it in stone. I'm just telling you what happened to me. And what happens with me is that, uh, for instance, let me give you an example of the kind of thing I'm worried and concerned about. If I meet some somebody on the street, some lady on the street, uh -huh. and we're talking, and she says to me, Jordan, I think you're an angel. And I said, well, thank you. You know, I don't know what that means, but thank you. I appreciate it. Um, and then later uh -huh. on, I'm talking on, the, on, on a radio show. And I say, yeah, I met a lady a couple of days ago who says, Jordan, I think you're an angel. And, uh, and, and that's it. I'm mean, I just repeating what she said. The next day, all over the web, uh, Jordan Maxwell last night was crazy. He said he was an angel. Oh, God, Jordan isn't that typical? An you know? Isn't that and disgusting? It's so damn oh. typical, you know, that yeah. I didn't say that. I said, if you were intellectually honest, which you're not, and if you had a brain, which you obviously don't, but if you were listening, I said, a lady said that to me. Mm -hmm. I didn't say that. She said it to me. So I want to preface my comments tonight by saying the same yeah. thing over. I am not validating anything I tell you tonight or ever. I'm just telling you what happened. So That's all we can do. You know, I, I've been misquoted uh, for 24 years. You've been misquoted for 54 years. People do that. They just yep. hear what they want to hear, or if they don't like you, they'll twist it and corrupt it, and they lie. And it, there's That's this... Exactly. this this allegedly sentient species has reached new lows in terms of morality, integrity, it's, honesty. It's it's, it's exactly bad. Right. Yeah, very, very bad. Because then you are held up to ridicule all over the world. Uh, other people who have not got the brains that that jerk had will pick up on what, what was said, and they will leave it as the actual, uh, actual God's honest truth. So they will put it out there. Well, did you hear that Jordan said this, this, and that? And then other people who don't like me to start with will hear about it. And thank God, now they've got a knife to cut my throat. And they will go out and say, yeah, did you hear this? And, that? and before you know it, it's everywhere yeah, yeah. on somebody who yeah. lied. Yeah. I never oh, yeah. said that at all. But yeah. So oh, I just, want, to, I just want the audience yeah. to know that that's what I have had to live with all of my professional life. Yeah, I talking to a, a brother in that regard. I totally understand, uh, but this <laughs> audience won't do that. Uh, this no, audience know, know is that. a special group, and uh, they're really I grateful know. that you share these things. And and I'll I'll never forget those stories uh, about uh, the little alien and what happened that night out in in the desert in the Nevada and. On and on yeah. and on. So many things you've told. And when you were a kid, you sent me a link the other day to your hometown, you, Pensacola, you grew up in. And, and, and I remember the story about the, the night and the car that went roaring by. And you were oh, a yes. kid of about six years old. And, and I also thought about how many, how many military people, how many Navy people. That's a huge military area. And E.T., would certainly be, if they're involved with us, or even if they're not, would be interested in in Pensacola. And there's a lot going on down there that probably has to do with E.T. in terms of the military. Now, that said, we have all the Gulf Breeze pictures. We have, who's to say you weren't dropped off there or augmented as a young, a young child, a very young child? Who, who knows? Who knows? Well, I, I'm telling you that that was the way I lived, even as a small child. I, I often saw alien uh, in my room and just a, a, a glimpse of picture. They didn't stay uh, there, but uh -huh. I just saw them, and, and it frightened me. And, and even when I was like seven and eight and nine years old, I would pull my, my little rinky-dink bed up to the window my, in my bedroom, and we have a screen window because the mosquitoes are so bad. You have to have screens. And so I pull my, my bed up to the window at night, 
uh, and so that I could lay in bed as an eight-year-old and, and look at the stars and talk to God. And that's what I kind of think I would do as a little kid. I would sit, lay in bed, looking at the stars and the moon, and 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 you know, and and uh, philosophize about my life and who I am and why I'm there, and all of that. And but um, but what would happen is that many times I would fall asleep, and then uh, in the middle of the night I would wake up very quickly, very quick. I wake up. And and I'm facing the window, and when I wake up, I would see uh, someone at my window. But it would be so quick; it would be like you know a fraction of a second. I open my eyes, I see something at, at my at my window, right there at my screen, and it would move so quickly. But I jump, I jump up, hit the screen, open the screen, and my dog is in the backyard. The full moon is out, so you can see everything. And my dog is not barking, and 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 I could see the whole yard, and nobody was running away, but I know I saw someone at my window. Well, that happened many, many times. I'd wake up at night, and someone would be right there at the window staring at me, and when I wake up, it would be gone instantly. And so huh. I know that something, you know, even back then, uh, you know, it was, it was something was going on with me, and I don't know what it was. But uh, since then, I've had all kinds of strange experiences, even as a child. And um, I don't even know where to start, you know. Uh, I was going to tell you the whole story about my experience out on the desert with those UFOs, because I never really told the full story, because I was always afraid to. Oh, let's do it. We, We had plenty of time. Let's go ahead. This, well, this is... I, I, I was afraid to do it because it was, you know, it will, uh, it's against my better judgment to, because people are going to, uh, you know, I was always afraid people are going to say that I said something. No, I didn't say it. I'm just telling you what happened. So um, <clears throat> this was back in 87, uh, mid-87, somewhere around in the middle of 80s, 1987. I was supposed to be, I was asked to be, the uh, best man at my friend's wedding. And so he lived up in Palmdale, which is about 50 miles north of Los Angeles in the high desert. And that, and it, back then, and, and back in 87, uh, there was only out there the big uh, military contractors like Lockheed and, and Martin and all the big, the big uh, defense contractors because it's a wide open high desert and nobody's out there and nobody cares to go out there and so that's where the, the big the big time contractors were doing whatever they're doing that's where they were doing it and so there was a lot of people living out there who were working at the, those bases etc and so one of my, my friend uh, was getting married and he wanted me to be a best man at his wedding so I agreed and so the idea was I go up, uh, I went up on a Saturday morning. He was getting married that night. And the idea was that I was going to spend the day with him and, and his uh, and his uh, and his lady and, and all of her friends. And they were doing getting ready for the wedding. And so the girls all decided they had to go out to the market. And so the mother, the girl he was marrying, and a couple of her girlfriends, and they all went out to the market. And so he and I was sitting there in the front room with a with a big uh, plate glass window so we could see everything. And after a while, they came home. And when they did, there was an old beat-up car following them. And the old guy got out of the car and uh, followed them up the walk. And we were watching that, thinking, who is this guy following you know, the girls? And they, they came up, they came in, and we were really curious because he came in with them. And, uh, and, the, girl, and, and, and the girl said, uh, this guy met us in the market, and he told us that uh, he knew we were getting married. He knew I was getting married. She's telling uh, uh, you know, uh, my friend and, and, uh, and myself, and she said, he told me that he knew I was getting married and that the best man uh, for the wedding is at your home. He's in the front room and I need to talk with him. And she said, how do you know I'm getting married? He says, look, at, I know everything about you. I just need to talk to the best man at your wedding and he's there at your house right now and I have a message for him. 
So I said to him, well, that's me, so talk to me. And he said, I am told to tell you that one year and a half from now, you are going to be out in a desert, and you're going to be way out in a desert. And because you believe that there are extraterrestrial life here, and you believe that there are, are other life forms of life here, and you, you believe that, but what you're going to do later in your life, uh, you're going to need to know they're here, mm -hmm. not believe they're here. Mm -hmm. And so they have told me to tell you that they're going to show themselves to you uh, a year and a half from now. And so I said, well, my friend and I, you know, we, uh, sometimes I'll come up here to this area in the high desert uh, north of uh, north of Los Angeles, I come up and he and I go out and you know look for UFOs and that kind of thing at night. It's fun right. to do. Right. And and this guy, this old man, said to me, "No, no, no. This is going to be not in California. It's going to be east of here, and you are going to be way out in a desert. And I mean, way out in the desert." And they are telling me they will pick where they will see you, and they will see you in the desert, but you're going to be driving the car, and there's going to be a lady in the front seat and a man in the back seat. <laughs> and they tell me that they want both a man and a woman to be a witness to what's going to happen to you, because they don't want, you know, all, both one sec, they want both a man and a woman to mm -hmm. testify what you're mm -hmm. going to see. And so that was in 87. Well, in, in 89, uh, toward the end of 89, I got an invitation to speak at the uh, big UFO Congress in, uh, in Mesquite, Nevada. Right. And so I drove out to Mesquite, and there was a lady friend I have in Hawaii uh, who was a talk show host, and she wanted to go. So she came over from Hawaii and, and uh, drove up with me and my friend in, in San Diego, uh, who was a publisher, his name was Paul Tice, and you probably know about him. Oh, yeah, I know who yeah. Paul is, sure. Okay, well, Paul was with me in the back seat, and so we drove up there. Well, when the conference was over, we were driving back on a Sunday morning to, uh, to come home, and just as we were coming into, because we were in Mes Mesquite, which is uh, east of Las Vegas, so you have to come through Vegas to get home. And so as we were coming into Las Vegas around Nellis Air Force Base that uh -huh. morning, uh -huh. uh, I said to both Ivy and Paul, I said, have either one of you ever been up to Area 51? No, we'd love to go. And I said, well, why don't we go up there? I mean, nobody, if you've got time, let's do it. And so I said to them, because I've done a lot of radio in Las Vegas, and, and they hear me up there in Rachel, Nevada, and they are always asking me to come up and visit. So I think we will. So we turned around and went back on the highway going up to Rachel, and we drove up there. And as we were driving, I told them, about this prophecy that this old man had back a couple of year and a half ago had given me and, uh, and I'm happy I did that telling him before <laughs> and so when we got up there they were happy to see us and so they give us a room at the little motel situation they have up there in Rachel Nevada and then we stopped for dinner and, and there was a bar and, and a restaurant there and that's about it. It's just the, the, the yeah. bar and the restaurant and a little mom and pop grocery store. And, uh, and, and that's about it, period. It. But it's right outside of the Area 51. And so uh, that night, uh, I asked uh, Joe and Pat Travis, dear people, dear people, uh, Joe and Pat Travis, who owned the little alien bar and restaurant. And so I asked them, I said, where do we go to see UFOs out? And then Joe, Joe, with his very uh, uh, cool humor, he said, "You don't have to go anywhere. They saw you coming, so huh. they want to show. They want <laughs> you to see them. You'll see them. Don't worry about it." Uh -huh. And so, but the wife, uh, the, the wife Pat, was a was a sweet, absolutely dear lady. She said, "Well, if you want to go where all the all the tourists go, go back on the highway right there on the highway, and go back south." Uh, on your way back to Vegas and go exactly 19 miles 
and, and, and watch it on your speedometer, 19 miles, and you will see uh, on the right-hand side going south, you will see a big mailbox right by the road. Stop at that mailbox because that's the famous uh, white mailbox that everybody knows. That's where you park because that's, uh, you know, that's where everybody goes to see the UFOs at Area 51. And so we, okay, so we got in the car. I'm driving. Uh, Ivy's in the front seat and Paul's in the back, just as that old man had said the year and a half before. And we drive out into the highway. I'm driving. And as we get on the highway, I turn left and go north. And Ivy didn't catch it, and Paul didn't catch it, and I wasn't even thinking. So I'm driving north for 19 miles. And when we're getting close to the 19-mile marker, I'm starting to slow down, put on my, put on my uh, uh, bright lights, and we're looking for the white mailbox. And then Ivy says to me, she said, wait a minute. Uh, you know, Pat said go south, and we're going north. And I said, you know, why didn't you tell me this 19 miles ago? You know? <laughs> yeah. So, so she said, I just thought about it. And so I said, all right, look it. Let's turn around, go back to bed, and then do it again tomorrow night. We'll do it right. So okay, mm -hmm. we'll do that. Mm -hmm. So we. What's stopped. the weather like out, Jordan? Yeah, the weather it was warm. It was summer night, but. We didn't realize it because it was nighttime. We didn't realize that it was totally, and I do mean 100%, totally overcast. Ah, no stars. No stars whatsoever, period. So mm -hmm. anyway, so as we stopped right. the car at the 19-mile mark, uh, there just happened to be a, a, a well-kept dirt road going out into the desert. And so Ivy and Paul said, great, there's a, there's a road going out into the desert. Let's drive out there. And I said, dear heart, we are in the desert. We've been in the desert for the past three and a hours. That's I'm not funny. going out. You know, I'm not <laughs> going on no dirt road out into the desert in a regular car. And so they kept telling me, look, I'll just go for a few moments. Nothing, you know, there's no sign. There's no signs are telling mm -hmm. you not mm -hmm. to. So I said, okay, all right. So no we'll lights, right? On. No lights, nothing. No, I got, I got the lights on. No, I mean and around so, you, around no, you. No, no, no <clears throat> light whatsoever. But mm -hmm. we didn't realize that. Didn't realize that. No and houses, so we, no farm built, no, no nothing. nothing. Zero, zero, nothing out there. We're already out in the middle of nowhere. And Rachel, which is about two and a half hour drive, uh -huh. frequent uh -huh. speed. Got it. Uh, and, and to the desert. And now mm -hmm. we're 19 miles past that <laughs> and so we finally get out we got get off the road we're driving about a block or so, or so away uh, out into the desert and all of a sudden i got the strangest uh overwhelming strange feeling that something was wrong something was bad and i told them I said, we've done something wrong, and I'm getting out of here. I don't know what it is. And I remember Ivy saying, There's no, there was no sign. There was no keep, you know, keep out and all that. And just stop the car. We'll get out for a minute. I said, I don't want to stop the car. And I backed the car up and headed, you know, so it was heading back to the, to the highway. And Paul and Ivy jumped on me and said, stop the car. Get out. We'll look just for a minute. And so I said, all right, I'm not going to argue. So I stopped the car, turned the lights off, and then it hit us that this, it was totally overcast because that's what dark is. <laughs> dark is when you're out in the middle of a desert and it's totally overcast and there's no light. You cannot see a thing, period. Got it. So we got out of the car and I'm holding onto the car because I know I know what, what we're doing, and I, I know my two friends are on the other side of the car, but you can't see anything, period. <laughs> and so I've never seen that kind of dark in my uh, life. And so we're standing there talking, and I said, Ivy, uh, as you can see, it's overcast. We're not going to see anything. And Ivy said, just hold on. And uh, when she said that, just north of us in the sky, uh, begin to open up a, an oval, but it was it was actually a beautifully designed oval. It was this perfect oval, and as it begins to open up, it got bigger and larger, larger and larger. Well, Could you see stars and, through it? 
Yeah, yes, you can see the stars. And, uh, and so I was going to say, anytime something is totally black, mm-hmm. any light whatsoever you mm-hmm. see immediately. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so when that oval opened up and we saw a few stars, uh, Ivy said, My, look at that, it's, it's opening up. And we all looked up north of the car, and, and there was an oval opening up in the sky. And, and just a few seconds after that, two, and I hate to use the term, but, it, was, but it, it, it is correct, two glowing saucer-shaped things uh, came through that oval coming in. And as they came in, they weren't flying. They were floating very, very quiet. They floated in, and as they floated into you know, under the, the the cloud layer, so we could see them, mm-hmm. they were a, they were uh, they were bluish white uh, light emanating off of them, and it was reflecting off of the heavy cloud layer above them, and it was absolutely frightening because they were making no sound. And yet there's two quiet, beautiful, and they were each one the size uh, to us on the ground. They looked about the size of a full moon. So it's not a little light. It's full moon size. This would be scary. Uh, Jordan, uh, what is the angle that you're looking up at? 45 degrees being halfway up, 90 degrees being straight up. Where where are you looking at? Straight up. They're they're right overhead? Straight overhead. Oh my! Because the because the oval had opened up, uh-huh. and these two beautiful, gorgeous, otherworldly, quiet, uh, saucer-shaped things come slowly in, and 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 they, they were beautiful but scary, and I was mesmerized for a few seconds, and and Ivy and Paul were dancing around like they were seeing Santa Claus for the first time. It was oh, look how beautiful they are, and I'm saying I don't like this. I don't know what this is. And while we were standing there looking at these two, five more came in behind the two. And now there were seven. And they're right over the top of our heads. They're glowing bluish white. And they are now moving in strange, uh, uh, you know, strange patterns. They would blow out into a seven pointed uh, circle. Then they would come back in instantly in a blink of an eye and to almost touching each other. Then they would blow out into a big wide circle of the seven. And I know we don't have that capacity. We do not have that kind of technology. And these things were beautiful. They were glowing, but they were frightening to me. And they were overhead. They were directly they were overhead. Right overhead. How, right overhead. Now, what was your sense? You're scared. They're not. Uh, They're Ivy not, and Paul, not. I was frightened. Yeah. What is your sense of... of uh, how high they might have been, a half a mile up, something like that? Uh, they were full moon size, probably a half a mile. Uh, well, I would say when the, when there's a heavy, heavy cloud layer, uh-huh. uh, that's, the, I don't know how, how high that oh, would my, be. Oh, no more than a mile high, probably. Yeah, yeah. 5,000 feet. So they close. might have been two, two 3,000 feet above you, maybe. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and they were, but they were absolutely un. Uh, not of this world, Jeff. Not of this world. They were bluish white, a bluish white light emanating, reflecting off of them on the clouds above them. And they were absolutely gorgeous. But my spirit told me there's something wrong here. Now, this is not human. This is not us. And it frightened me. I mean, I was legitimately scared. They weren't. And so I, I told them, I said, look, I'm leaving. I'm getting in the car. I'm going. You want to stay here? You can walk home. Wow. And I got in the car, and I wanted to get out of there. And it was, I haven't turned on the lights or anything, but I got in the car. And they got in the car knowing that I was serious. I was scared. They weren't. And so Ivy gets in the front seat, and, and Paul gets in the back, just as the old man had said. And, and these seven glowing uh, disc-shaped objects are right over the top of us. And so I, pull, I took off. I, I, put, I put the car in drive, and I took off. And when I did, it was in total black because on one side of my brain, I was thinking if I get out of here quiet, uh, you know, in the dark, they won't see me leaving. 
the other half of my mind told me, are you kidding? <clears throat> we have technology, we can see a, a rat <laughs> at, at night. So I know that they can see me. They know we're here. That's why they're doing what they're doing. And so I flipped on the light and put my foot to the floor. And when I did, Ivy and Paul were leaning out the window of the car, still watching. And the, both of them went ballistic. When I hit the gas, both Ivy and Paul started yelling and screaming. And now they were really and legitimately frightened. And But I'm already frightened. And now i got a woman in the front seat that's ballistic. And I'm screaming at her to shut up. And I don't want to overshoot the highway, but I was speeding toward the, the highway, but I didn't want to overshoot it and, and ruin the car. And so I stopped the car quickly and looked out the window, and they were right over the top of us, but they had come down, and now they're really big all around us, over the overhead. Seven of them moving around, bluish-white bluish lights, and making no sound, but I knew we were in big trouble. And I hit the gas again and got back on the highway. When I hit the highway, I, I skidded onto the highway. When we hit the highway, for some reason, all three of us felt safe. And it was as somebody turned off whatever they had turned on in us that turned us off. And we were no longer frightened for some reason. It just disappeared. But then we got out on the highway uh, 19 miles uh, uh, you know, north of Little Alien, probably about 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning. And we got out, and we're standing there shaking. And, and, and every emotion that you can imagine was blowing through us. I mean, there was tears. There was uh, frightened. It was beautiful. It was an incredible, wonderful, beautiful, frightening and you know, just anything well, and everything that you can feel Jordan, is going through. When you when you when you're driving on the dirt road back toward the highway, was that when Paul and Ivy switched from their elation to being yes, fearful? Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, and they how were, long were, Go ahead. And the reason why is because when I opened up I, I, I took off in the dark, but I knew we're not gonna go anywhere. So I flipped on the light and when I hit the gas Ivy and Paul was looking out the window at them. That's when both Ivy and Paul went ballistic because these the seven beautiful objects now came down right over us. A hundred, they couple hundred right feet, down, right, right down over you. Okay. Right down over us, and as if they were scaring us. And so, uh, and it was scaring us. Now all three of us were frightened. And, and how long, so, Jordan? One more question. How long were you parked? And outside the car, watching the oval open up, watching the seven seconds. come down. 30 seconds, if that. You mean the oval opened up. up and the two came down, then the five after them within That's 30 right. seconds? That's right. Within 30 seconds, all five were there in front of us. All right seven. Our, all seven. All seven. And the then they were putting on their, their, putting on their show for you. That's right. They were putting on a show for us. There's no doubt about that. They were showing us what they could do. And what they were doing was so incredible maneuvering that they would come together in a circle. All seven would come together and in less than a, a, a you know, in a fraction of a second, <clears throat> they would blow out into a large circle. And then within a tiny fraction of another second, they would blow back into a tight circle. Hmm. And then they would blow out in all directions, and everybody would change uh, positions with each other. All seven would change positions instantly in a blink of an eye. And so I knew this was not of this world. We are seeing something that is not human. Humans cannot do this. And so when we got out the highway, we, we, we felt safe, and we're standing out there, and all the emotions are blowing through our bodies. I've never had that kind of an experience before when and everything you could feel you were feeling it <clears throat> were you and, looking and so, back were you looking yeah, back we were looking back what did you but, see when you looked back well see that's where i am i am i can't remember exactly but i do remember that they went back out into the desert ivy and paul stood there looking i was having my head uh, away from them because i was i was so scared wow and so after after a few minutes of standing there shaking 
and trying to get my composure and our composure back, we got in the car. We decided we'll go back and we will go back to to the little A L E M. Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll stay overnight and uh, and see what happens. But tomorrow. as far as you know, the seven retreated and went back into the desert. Yes, yes went back into the desert. All right. <clears throat> And 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 they were gone. That was it. It's like the dogs chasing you off the property, and you're off. So now they just go back, and uh, and everything's fine now. <laughs> and so when we were driving back, we were talking, and we, you know, obviously, what was it we experienced tonight? Was this our technology, or was this somebody else? And all three of us knew, without a doubt, this was not human. And so when we got back to the, the motels, like 1, 1.30 in the morning, well, and the particular one we were in, you walk into the front door, and you walk directly into a bathroom. And on one side of the bathroom, uh, well, on both sides of the bathroom, were bedrooms. And one had two beds, and one had one. And so I was scared to death. And I and, and Ivy is the kind of person I'd like to be around if there's problems because she doesn't get scared. <laughs> and so I said, well, Ivy, why don't you and I take this bedroom? And Paul said that he'll take the other one on the right-hand side. So we were lying in bed with the doors open uh, between the bedrooms <clears throat> talking about what did we see tonight. And we finally fell asleep. <clears throat> And the next morning, when I got up, Paul and Ivy had already gotten up and gone to, to have breakfast. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so I went over to the little alien and go in, and Paul and Ivy are sitting there talking to a bunch of people around the table. Right. And I think that they're probably telling everybody about what happened to us last night. And that area, incidentally, that area that it happened was called Railroad Junction. It's 19 miles north of, uh, of Little Alien huh. called Railroad Junction. So anyway, I went in and I saw them talking. And so I figured, what's well, what's Railroad Junction about. famous for? Anything? Uh, well, it's famous for me. <laughs> what? But I don't, I don't know. They ought to call all it uh, Jordan Junction now. Yeah. <laughs> and all I know is that people tell me, yeah, that 19 miles north of here is Railroad Junction. I don't mm-hmm. know what it means, and mm-hmm. I didn't see any railroads, but that's what they called it. So anyway, I sat down and and to you know with um, Paul and Abby and the whole group at the table, uh-huh. and and then I discover. They're not talking about what happened to us last night. They're talking about the alien that came in our room last night. What? Yeah, we had an alien come in our room. It followed us back and came in our room. While you were asleep. uh, And I was asleep. And so, but it came into Paul's room. It came into his room. Uh Uh-huh. And... And uh, you're going to have to have Paul on your show and, and have him tell you what he saw because it was so absolutely outrageous. Well, I did years and years ago, but let's get him back. Uh, yeah, yeah. We need to get him back, and maybe I'll be on with him. Oh, we please. Talk, yeah, we'll but, both need uh, to come back. We'll, we'll go through this through his eyes. That's Yeah, be... I, that's exactly right. I, wanna, I just want him to tell you what okay. this alien right. looked like and what it did. So anyway, Ivy said she saw, uh, he said basically that he looked up, uh, he woke up, was fully wide awake uh, in the middle of the night, and there was a, 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 a light green light uh, over his head where there was a night light on the ceiling, but there was light green. And he said, when I looked up at the light green light, it was actually an alien's face with the bubble eyes, the the typical alien face, but it was a hologram. You could see through it, and you could see the ceiling, uh, you know, uh, uh, through it. And he said the, the hologram face of the alien slipped over across the the, uh, the ceiling, and it hit the wall, and then came down the wall so that it was uh, even with him sitting in bed looking at it. And it talked with him and communicated with him. And, uh, and What did it look like, Jordan, did he say? Okay. He said it's the typical uh, 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 alien face of a round, uh, an oblong face with the big eyes, the, uh-huh. big, the big eyes, uh-huh. small opening for a, for a, for the nose area and a small mouth. Right. But it was a it was a, uh, um, a hologram, 
uh, it looked like a hologram because you could see the wall behind it. And he said that when he when he looked straight at this uh, uh, face looking at him, he said the the room began to circulate. It began to circulate around, and he could see the front door, and he could see the 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 doors rolling around, the the walls circulating, and yet the alien's face stayed right where it was, and the whole room was circulating around it, or at least mm. in his mind, that's mm -hmm. what what was what was happening. Mm -hmm. And he said, and finally it said, who are you and what are you doing here? And, and Paul said, I didn't know how to. I knew it was telepathically talking to me, but I'm trying to figure out how do you do that to telepathically talk back to it. And he said, and then it told me, he said, then it went through my mind. It went, it, it, it went through his, his mind and saw everything. He said, for the first time in my life, I saw everything I had ever done in my whole life in just a split second. And I understood it all. And he said, it went through my mind instantly and then said to me, you're all right, you're okay. So it went through his whole mind to see everything. You know, he don't have to tell this alien what he's doing. Uh, that that creature was able to see what, where who, you know, who he was and where he's been. So he said, you're all right, you're okay, and I'm leaving. And then the, the, the head went out through the wall. It just left through the wall. Well, Ivy said she saw a greenish light in, in Paul's bedroom because our uh, doors were open. And she said when she saw it, when she woke up and saw that greenish light, a little tiny red light comes zipping in over the top of her, and she said she was totally paralyzed. She couldn't move, and the best she could do is just draw enough breath to stay alive. But she couldn't say anything or move. And then when that green light, which was Alien's face, backed out of the room and went through the wall to leave, that little red light went with it. And so, and she said, so they were talking about this when I walked in. And so I said to them at the table, I said, well, I didn't see anything. And Pat Travis said to me, no, you didn't see anything because they know who you are. And they know you've got a bad heart and they didn't want to frighten you. So they, they let you sleep uh, and they were just messing with your friends. And I, I thought that was so interesting. That she would say that off the cuff so quickly. She said, no, no, they know who you are. They're not, they're not going to, they know that you've got a bad heart and they're not going to mess with you. Uh, and they were just playing with your friends. They were just messing with them. And so that was it. So how uh, often Jordan, now that's Pat Travis, the owner. Yeah. Pat, Pat Travis. Mm -hmm. Now, how often do you think, Pat and her husband have had direct or indirect encounters at the Little Alien. Oh, well, uh, uh, t talking with them, Paul and Ivy and I sat and talked with them over lunch and dinner, and they were telling me all kinds of things. And sometimes these aliens will come into their restaurant when they're closed, when they're closing up at night. Uh -huh. These entities will come through a wall, and uh -huh. they'll see them in the in the in the restaurant, and then they go walk back through the wall, and they're gone again. And Pat said, "But we've come to know that they're not here to harm us. Uh, it's just that they feel that this is their territory, and you are on it, so they can come in any time they please, and they're going to any time they please, or there's nothing you're going to do about it." <laughs> so she said, "But they've never harmed us, and they've never, you know." And she said, "Sometimes." Uh, Joe was telling me that one night he woke up and, and uh, looked out his uh, bedroom window and there was a little alien walking and, the, uh, and there was what the dog, but the dog wasn't barking. And he said, for some reason, I just woke up and looked out the window and there was a little alien out there walking and the dog was walking with him uh, over the parking lot. And he said, I, I was amazed. This little creature was out there walking. Uh, and the dog is walking with him like he had good sense. I've never and heard so, that that before. That is yeah. remarkable. Yeah, and so, but now that's that's just the first third of the story. So then, <laughs> <laughs> so then, uh, Paul and I and, and and Ivy, we we stay out there for another day or so, and then we drove back to L.A. Well, I uh, Ivy was going back to Hawaii, so we had uh -huh. to take her to the airport first, uh -huh. and then Paul and I were living in San Diego. And so we dropped her off at the airport, and we're driving back. Well, then uh, I go back to work. I was working at the Truth Seeker Company, which was a publishing oh, house. Oh, I remember company. those days. 
Yeah. And so uh, uh, Paul lived in San Diego, and I did too. And so uh, maybe a month after this happened, um, uh, uh, Paul called me and said, I heard that there's a, there's a girl down in on Coronado Island named Kieran, K-I-R-I-N, Kieran. And she's supposedly as a past life regressionist. And I heard she's really, really good. He said, why don't you make an appointment with her and go talk to her and see if she is as good as I heard. And I said, I don't care about past life regression. You want to talk to her. Why don't you make the appointment? And he said, no, no, you're much closer to her than I am. So I said, okay. So I called her, and she's a very sweet girl. And, and so I made an appointment to go down and do a past life regression, whatever that is. And so I drove down there that day, that morning, and she's on Coronado Island. And when I get there, she's, uh, as I said, she's a very, very sweet girl. And so I go in, and she has you take off your rings and watches and any metal that's on you, and take out any change in your pocket. And I'm laying on a table that's like an exercise table. And uh, and she's going around lighting a candle, and uh, and she's talking to somebody as she's lighting the candles and preparing for this uh, uh, this reading, I guess. And I'm just laying there listening to her talking. And, and, uh, and then she says, she starts laughing. And I said, Karen, who are you, Karen, who are you talking to? Because there's nobody in the house but her and I. I said, who are you talking to? And she said, oh, I'm sorry. She said, I'm talking to your friends who brought you here. And I said, what do you mean brought me here, to your house? She said, no, 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 to the earth. I'm talking to those who brought you here, to the earth. Uh -huh. And I said, you know what? I've often wondered, how the hell did I get here? Uh, you know, <laughs> since, since you seem to be on good, the good rapport with, with my friends who brought me here, whatever that means, uh -huh. I, asked them, I asked them, where did I come from and, and what am I doing here? And she told me, uh, which I'm not going to say on, on the air, but she told me where she, where my friends thought, you know, where they brought me from. And so I said, and so then she, uh, I, 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 every time I tell this story, I always forget and leave out the uh, important part. And so before I went to see Kieran, uh, when I got back, this is what I forgot to, to mention. So when I got back into San Diego with Paul uh -huh. and Ivy's on the plane back to Hawaii, yeah, uh, I went back to work. And then a few a few months later, this was in the first week of December of 1989. And so the first or uh, the first week in spring or the second week in spring uh, of 1990, I was working and I decided to take off and go back up to Area 51 again by myself. And nobody knew this. I didn't tell anyone at work. I didn't tell Paul. Nobody. So I rented a Chrysler convertible, and I drove up there by myself, intending to spend two or three days and just hanging around at night where I saw them and, and see what else I might Back see. to uh, Railroad Junction? Yeah, back to Railroad Junction. And so I went up and got a motel again at the little early end because there ain't nothing else out there. Yeah. So I got, a, I got a motel room for three or four days, and I was staying with Joe and Pat at the little early end. And then I'd go out in the afternoon, and I, I, I didn't want to go out at night because I uh -huh. get spooked at night. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I, I go out in the afternoon. And I go out there, and I went to 19 miles north, and uh, there's the road. Yeah. And I drove out into the road about a block and a half or more uh, to just about where I was the last time I was out there. Mm -hmm. And then I turned the car around like I did before and aimed it back at the highway. And then I got out of the car, and I sat on the back hood with my feet in the back seat. It was a convertible, Chrysler right. convertible. Mm -hmm. And I started talking. To I looked up in the in the sky and I just started talking and I said, "Look, at, I know you're here, and I know that you are here watching me, and I know also that you didn't mean to harm me because if you did, I wouldn't be here, and so I just want you to know that I was very frightened, 
And But if I'm supposed to do something, if, if the Great Spirit has given me something to do, uh, then I am willing to do it. But I would ask two favors of you. And 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 I, I actually felt I was talking to somebody. I said, I have two favors to ask of you. One, I do not want to be taken anywhere. Do not take me somewhere I don't want to go. Just leave me here mm -hmm. and show me and give me whatever it is I am to do mm -hmm. uh, for the mm -hmm. Great Spirit, and I will do it. And then my other, my other request is uh, do not frighten me in my bedroom. I don't want to wake up and be frightened at my age of my heart. I, I don't, you know, I've already been frightened enough. I don't want this. And so I thanked them, and I got in the car and went back and stayed for a couple of days, and then went back to work in San Diego. Then about uh, uh, two or three weeks later, Paul calls me about this girl, the past life regressionist. So hmm. I go down to see her, this girl named Kirin, mm -hmm. uh, K-I-R-I-N. And uh, and she's on the Coronado, Coronado Island. So I drive over to see her, and she says, and she's talking to someone, like I said, and, and I ask her who, and she said, I'm talking to the, the, the they who brought you here. And I said, to, to your home? She said, no, no, who brought you to the earth? You've come back. Well, that's what I remember Kenny Kingston saying. You know, they have brought you back. And so I said, well, since you are on such good terms with them, uh, would you ask him, where did I come from and what am I coming back for? Well, why am I even here? And, she's, and she starts, uh, and she said, they're telling me to tell you that they have brought you back and they're going to use you as a, as a uh, what was the word she used, as a uh, channel. They're going to use you like a channel, not mm -hmm. a channel, but like that. Mm -hmm. In which they're going to, they're going to have you uh, expose but religion and government and conspiracies, they brought you here to do that. Wow. And, she said, and the reason why they brought you is because where you have come from, you were the only one in your society from where you came from that had the, uh, the credentials to do that. You had the, the, uh, the, the uh, authority to do that. So they couldn't come and do it. They had to bring you. And so they brought you here to do a job for them, to do something that they needed to, you know, that they felt needed to be done on the earth, and they brought you here to do it. And that was that they want you to expose the darkness of religion and government and conspiracies in the world today. And they brought you here to do that. And she said, but they're telling me that you're not an ambassador. And this was interesting. She, she was very, uh, very uh, uh, pronounced about it. She said, they're telling me to make sure you understand you are not an ambassador because an ambassador speaks for the government that he represents, but you do not speak for them. You are an emissary. You're just carrying a message. And those who listen, fine, and those who don't, that's fine. But you're just carrying a message. And they brought you here to do that. And and she said, and uh, they will protect you and guide you to do what you have to do. But you've been brought here to do it. Well, again, that just reminded me of what Kenny Kingston had said, you know, so, so many years earlier. They have brought you back. And so that was the bottom line, and they told me, she told me, you know, they brought you back. And then also she began to laugh, and I asked her, I said, what are you laughing at? And she said, they t they're saying something funny about you. They're telling me something funny about you. And I said, what are they saying? She said, they said that you rented a car, a Chrysler convertible, and you drove up to uh, Area 51 and went back out to the very spot they saw you the last time, and you sat on the back of your car with your feet in the back seat, and you told them you didn't mind doing what you're supposed to do, but you didn't want to be abducted, and you didn't want to go anywhere and see anything in your bedroom. And she, and she laughed at that, and, I, and, I, and she said they thought that was funny. They, they saw humor in that. Well, and that's I said, good. why? That's... Yeah, yeah. And, and she said they saw humor in that. That's the... Uh... Now, that's very interesting that um, they apparently have a sense of humor. Yes. And yes. That's, that's fascinating. And it, it's, it was, was, that's exactly right. It was fascinating to me, too, because they saw humor in it. 
And, and I asked her, what is so funny about that? And she said, they're telling me that if you knew what you look like from the world that you have come from, as opposed to the human that, that you are now, uh, then you know you think it's scary before. You know, wait till you wait till you leave oh, this that, world. That's that's really funny. Yeah. Yeah. And so and so I don't know. I'm just telling you what she said. <laughs> what so, a wonderful and, story! Wow. That's the story of meeting them out on the desert. <laughs> 